Okay, please come up. Uh, my name is Bob Halpern. I'm a research affiliate at the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. It's my privilege to facilitate this conversation today uh, here focusing on influencing large firms. So still waiting for a couple of the other panelists uh, to arrive, but let me just describe where we're going, what we're doing uh, this morning. As uh, Tom and Laura said in the plenary session, the theme here is from idea to action. How can we really make a difference? How can we contribute to taking some of these winning ideas forward? Uh, we will have uh, three panelists who I will introduce in a moment when they're all here. Uh, we'll be going through the three winners. That, we don't have a slide on the list of the winners, do we? Um, or we just have one for each? Okay, that's fine. So we'll be going through the three. Uh, I'll be introducing them. The way it will work is each one will have three minutes to uh, describe briefly their idea. I'll be timing it to uh, make sure we stay on track. Uh, we'll then have about 10 minutes or so for the panelists to respond, the panel, to respond to the, um, my folks, um, you're really, really <laughs> valuable, exactly. Um, and uh, then if we have time, we'll take a question or two or a comment or feedback from the audience. Um, but we'll um, move on so that we take no more than 15 minutes for each winner. And then, then at the end, depending on how much time we have left, I'll have to just watch the clock. We may break into little subgroups where you can actually come up and talk to this winner or the two winners who are going to be virtually with us, uh, or we may just do it in plenary uh, session. Uh, so that's the basic format. Um, I'm going to, because of this focus on um, action, uh, I'm going to violate our policy a little bit of it completely paper free because I want to make a point and I want to really encourage you to take an action. Uh, I'm going to ask each person to take an index card, including our people who are up here, and I'll explain what the index cards are going to be for just a moment. Um, so could you guys just help me pass, can you just pass them to this side of the room and make it go out and pass them? So the idea of the index card um, is that what I'd like you to do is break, uh, cut it in half, tear it in half, um, and write your name and your email address on the card. Okay? And uh, your goal at this conference, as I suggest to you, it's not a requirement, it's strongly suggested, is that sometime during this conference, you're going to give to one of the winners. Uh, either the winners who are present here today in, in this panel or one of the other sessions that you attend this afternoon. Uh, you're going to give them your business card, which is your name and your email address. If you want to put your organization or your uh, or anything else on there, that's fine. It's their responsibility to follow up with you afterwards, but they'll know if they get this from you. Uh, well, I don't know if they'll know in every other session because I'm introducing this in this session. But, um, I want you to try to take action by thinking of something you can do to help the um, uh, winners, and particularly the winners that we're going to be uh, hearing from today. Uh, what could you contribute to the winner's work? What action could you help them with to help move their idea forward? Uh, is there an introduction you could make, a connection you could make uh, to them? Is there some way you could volunteer or donate or connect them to other sources of funding or support, anything that you can think of. So the goal is to take this and pass that along to the, um, um, to the winners. OK, without any further ado, then let me introduce our, our full panelists here now. Um, and again, for their benefit, I'm Bob Halpern, research affiliate at the Center for Collective Intelligence. And uh, our panel, actually met all of them already, because they were in the uh, plenary session, but just quickly, uh, Jason J. Uh, Director of Sustainability Initiatives uh, of, Slo of Sloan Sustainability at MIT. Uh, Sloan, uh, Victoria Mills uh, from the Environmental Defense Fund, and Matt Seibel, Swibel, excuse me, uh, from Lockheed Martin. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to go to our first uh, presenter, Hannah, and I think you have a video to show from Hannah. Uh, is that right, Manuel? Yes. So we're ready to cue that up. Okay, while that's coming up, I'll just say to the panel, you will be invited 
you might want to take that. Also, you know, what concrete can we do to support them? 
Um, I would say that uh, the big question here in terms of um, retail shelving positioning is a very hot uh, economic and political issue within the retail business. So um, the vendors pay for, often will, will create, you know, there's incentives essentially within the buyer relationship between retailers and product producers about where their stuff gets shelved because at the eye level they sell much better. Um, and so what you're talking about when you're talking about disrupting the pattern of shelving, putting things on high, medium, or low shelves vert vertically or visibly, um, it's a major disruption to that relationship and one that um, that that would interfere with the kind of basic business model of that, of that relationship. So what you'd have to do is, work with my suggestion would be to work with a grocery chain for whom this is really a strong identity big issue. Uh, you know, it's kind of a natural food chain or a, you know, possibly Whole Foods within the U.S. is a federated organization that's very decentralized. They have 12 subregions, each of which has a fair amount of autonomy to do experimentation. So working with one subregion of the Whole Foods network might be an interesting place for them to experiment. But again, I think it's important to be conscious of how could this red, yellow, green shelving system dovetail with the existing compensation business model that exists in the retail uh, in the retail <coughs> business environment. So that, those are my quick quick hit comments from things that I've seen in this sector. Um, and um, the connection that I will help you make is that one of our former students, Adam Siegel, is the head of sustainability for the Retail Industry League of America, which is the industry association for retail and companies in the U.S. Um, and he knows all the heads of sustainability for all the retail companies, including a lot of the grocers, um, and can help think more about the nuances of this idea. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that's perfect. Thank you. So, Victoria, would you like to go next? Do you want to comment, react, uh, <coughs> suggestions? Hi, Hannah. Hi. Thank, um, thank you for your, your great idea. What I love is the consumer education component of it, which, you know, we all, I like to read labels. I, I don't know if people like to read labels, but I think there's a there's a kinesthetic aspect of this, because actually going to a place in the store where things are, have a lower part of the brain versus a higher one that brings your brings your body into it in a way and engages your brain in, in a new way than, than just a label. I think I see some of the same challenges that you see about, like, Real estate in a, a supermarket is an incredibly highly valued property, and so I think for you to see broad scale adoption, you have to make it work for the retailer. And you need to be able to demonstrate a strong business case to them that this would not adversely impact their business. So if you could find retailers to partner with um, to try this out um, and get some demonstration of success, that, that would help you move your idea forward. And Jason stole my recommendation at this point. Adam <laughs> <laughs> he was an EDF intern. Yes, yeah, that's right. He was an EDF. Hi, Anna. Hi. So, three thoughts. First is uh, the simplification angle is is the most um, promising. I think. I'm not sure if um, with all the the texts and apps. And that, that consumers are already interacting with, maybe when they're entering a retail environment, um, that more uh, more data at a very detailed level is going to uh, is going to be advantageous. In terms of who might be good targets, um, there's a pro proliferation of food co-ops in urban centers that are um, where there's a bigger following from sourcing, as well as in Scandinavia, some of the retailers. Are trying to distinguish themselves uh, by by focusing more on environmental footprint and sustainable sourcing. The last idea is remember you know 15 years ago when there was one dedicated shelf for organic foods in a store, and it was similar shelf politics. You know maybe you you start out with one corner, um, either high volume or um, high margin. Um, products and do your shelving there, and they learn from consumer behavior. The retailer will learn from the consumer behaviors of how to, to implement it, which which categories, which aisles it makes sense to roll out further. Can I have one more? Sorry, to <laughs> talking. Um, sorry to, uh, to take more time, but the other idea that just came to me was um, when Victoria was talking about consumer education and Matt was talking about simplification would be to actually do a museum exhibit um, around this concept. So you create sort of a virtual grocery store shelves that could be installed in. Here in the Museum of Science in Boston, there was actually a whole exhibit on food 
um, that got at some of these issues. But the, the idea of sort of a virtual grocery store that you could walk into where things were shelved on red, yellow, teams, and you'd have that kind of aesthetic experience that, that Victoria was describing, could even do it in virtual reality, it might be an interesting kind of um, selling tool as you engage with the retail companies, but also something that might deliver educational value in its own right. Um, and, and that suggests one other possibility, Hannah, which is that since so much of the shopping is going online to uh, Amazon and Peapod and other home delivery services, there may be ways to work through that uh, channel <laughs> of communication, not just physical shelves. Uh, so, um, Hannah, if it's okay, I'll just take one or two comments from the audience, uh, and then we'll give you a minute to respond, or two to respond, and uh, then we'll move on to the next one, and then we'll have some time to beat up. So, Yes, please. Uh, can you come up here uh, and speak? And again, uh, better be brief uh, and either comment, question, or action. Yes. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> My name's Dave Finnegan, and we are the winners of the Youth Action Contest. I think there are things that we can do together because we've got a Youth Action card where families get discounts and schools get rebates based on their shopping experiences. Uh, and so the kids uh, can urge their parents to shop on a particular shelf, and then the school get a rebate for the purchases made by the family. Also, schools can use their media center. We used to call it the library, now it's the media center. And they can put the same color shelving in their school library and train kids uh, on what the shelving means. So I think it's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Other comments, suggest questions, uh, things that people could do to help on this? Yes, please come up so that uh, she can see you and also hear you. Uh, hi, Anna. Yeah. Cameras there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think the idea of, uh, of putting a, a copy of some sort on the product is a great idea. But what struck me about the idea of uh, putting uh, products in a certain shelving area was a sort of a public versus private choice. I think, in, at least in the town I come from, I think people might be open to the idea, or would be open to the idea of looking at individual products and what their carbon content was. But if it was a, a shelf that was labeled red, my sense is a lot of consumers would feel that they were you know, making a choice in public that you know was uh, against the uh, public perception. So just this public-private concept is one that you know, I, I, I might need to be thought to a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Yeah, and as, as you come up, if you can just say your name as well, and Hannah will try to get you the names of the people who are offering specific assistance as well. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Dreyfus. Hi, Hannah. Um, Hi. I just wanted to uh, to uh, draw a parallel uh, with seafood labeling, where uh, with, when one goes to Whole Foods or other retailers, they're, they're green, yellow, and red labels. We don't really know exactly what they mean. We just know that green is better than yellow is better than red. And it seems like uh, that has a lot of potential to uh, influence consumption patterns. So um, I'm not sure exactly how that ties in here, but I thought, I thought it was uh, worth a parallel convention. Thank you. Any others? Okay, let me, uh, one more, yes, please come on. One more and then we'll let Hannah respond. Hi, uh, my name is Sergio and five years ago I was doing my PhD research actually on exactly this topic and how people use, uh, we can put labels on, uh, specific labels particularly coming from life cycle assessments. And I have an article uh, we published in the Journal of International Journal of Life Cycle Analysis that I can provide to Hannah. But the key to our research was that actually presenting information in a more complicated, if you want, quantitative, argumentative way, sort of um, let people into more complex assessments, but increase credibility from the source. And so sometimes, yes, putting information just with a very simple green, red, another kind of label, but actually providing that information 
it could help credibility, which many companies are looking for. And so I put my name here and uh, suggesting that I can send you the article. I'll be glad to do that. Great. Thank you. I'll make sure it comes back to work. Okay, so Hannah, let us give you a moment or two to respond to what you've heard today. Any further thoughts, reactions to what you've heard uh, today? Great, I'd just um, like to say thanks for the opportunity. It's um, been really great to be involved. Um, in addressing kind of the general comments, a lot of the things that people um, brought up were all very valid criticisms and they're all stuff that I'm trying to bear in mind. I mean, um, the issue of kind of supermarkets and retailers being reluctant to choice edit for their customers is a big one. Um, I think it would be a very big step for a retailer to take um, to take this sort of approach. Um, in terms of implementing it, I think it would have to be done on a gradual kind of step by step basis that kind of builds up in its invasiveness essentially. Um, so some of the ideas <coughs> that kind of tie in with what people have recommended was say having a, like a corner of a store, I mean a, a kind of idea um, that consumer that retailers might be more open to is say at the front of the store having just like one display um, of a kind of uh, example of where some of the foods would go on the different shelves rather than redoing the whole store because because I know a shelving system to supermarkets and uh, and their suppliers is quite a big deal in terms of um, suppliers buying rights to have a certain position on a shelf and they'd probably be reluctant to, to shake that all up. Um, the scheme is more, more, it's less about making consumers' choices for them and more about informing them. Um, from from a lot of the studies that have that have been done on say carbon labeling, the kind of key thing that comes out of it is that people don't really understand what a gram of CO two means. So the kind of key the key message is to try and demonstrate to consumers and give them the information they need to make the choices in as simple a manner as possible, which is why I kind of chose the, the simple the simple colour system. Um, but I do agree with the comments that I think going straight into a, a whole shake up of a retail store would be very unrealistic um, and would have to be done a kind of step by step process, either through say an app that informs consumers um, a display in just a corner of the store. You could essentially do it by some of their online grocery shopping systems. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you to, to everyone for the comments. They're really useful and hopefully I can get in touch with some of the people that have um, offered to share their contacts or whatever. Uh, maybe everybody has the, her contact information through the website, is that right? So people can contact you through, through the website, people can contact you. Uh, and yeah. send you an email. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs>
are designed to confuse our public, to sabotage our science and slander our peers. This is not the MIT way, and this is not the university way. Einstein said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And since 2012, our student group, also pre MIT, has been calling on the Institute to divest its $12.5 billion endowment from the fossil fuel industry. The investment recognizes that it's political will and not technology that's now the bottleneck to mitigating global warming. For sure, no one denies the importance of technology, especially at a place like MIT, but almost as few people recognize that and realize that it's actually, we actually have most of the technologies we need to begin mitigating global warming. What we lack is the political will to implement them. The political will to put a price on carbon to correct for the greatest market failure in the history of money. The political will to say no longer will we allow these companies to legally bribe our politicians and merchandise out. And the political will to say we're going to take serious kind of action. And divestment has a proven theory of change. We're not seeking to financially bankrupt these companies, but to politically bankrupt them. The investment works by stigmatizing business as usual, by shifting the socio-political landscape, by leveraging our university's moral prestige, and in doing so, diminishing that these companies' political influence so as to create breathing room for meaningful leadership and legislation. And the good news is that this is the fastest growing divestment movement in history with more than $51 billion of assets already going fossil free. Here at MIT, our petition has been signed by almost 3,000 MIT members, including more than one in four undergrad. And in response, President Reif has already launched a campus-wide climate conversation for action. And so I think this evidence is how the divestment movement, even before it's been achieved, can actually start to shift behavior by promoting climate consciousness, inspiring and igniting a sense of generational mission in young people, and inspiring an electorate and yielding in its desire for an energy revolution. So how can you help? Well, most importantly, if you have experience in negotiation, uh, marketing, media strategy, or social movement building, we'd love to speak to you straight after this. And I guess even more importantly, if you have an affiliation with any university, but especially MIT, please sign our petition, please chat to us, and visit fossilfreemit.org to get involved. Thanks very much. Disaggregating different aspects of the fossil fuel, right? So, um, so there's you know cleaner forms of natural gas if you are doing really methane leakage well and um, dealing with the you know, building of your value chain at one end of the spectrum, and then there's you know some you know coal production at the other end. So, um, my you know I think part of the there's certainly going to be a vanguard of activists who are going to join on with a, a kind of all-encompassing. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I've always sort of thought that maybe there's a way of sort of defining a long, you know, a particular tail of carbon intensity of these businesses and say that's what we should be managing as a set of risks, both as a moral issue but also as an investment uh, risk management issue if those things are being regulated out and people are facing that. Um, the other thing is that um, the other sort of question I always want to raise about this is how should we be thinking about sequestration? Um, and is there, you know, is, is eliminating all fossil fuels the strategy, or is there a way of doing, you know, some form of, you know, is investment in those kinds of technologies useful kind of problem? Um, so those are the two, that, that's, that's the nuance to this. At the same time, recognizing that an effective political campaign is one that has a clear message and, and, and a courageous uh, one. Uh, so those, those are, I would say. So, we hear for all the experts have a plan. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, what panels have you found? I think I want to join Jason in, in uh, commending the clarity of the message, and I think the divesting movement in general has done a fantastic job of attracting youth and, and galvanizing youth excitement around climate action, um, which I I would like to see not you know extend through that issue through broader political engagement. 
Um, I think we need divestment, but we also need more than divestment. We need political activism across the economy. Um, there are two questions that I would have is, um, how do you see your input relating to the broader activist movement on climate action? And um, for example, um, if you think about what is the lever they're trying to pull here, it's MIT's influence of their the size of their endowment and the it conflict on the fossil fuel industry and the drawing that investment. Are there other ways that you're also encouraging MIT to use its political power and its voice um, in in speaking in speaking out on the issue of climate change? My other question kind of relates to Jason's comment about the fossil fuel industry. If it's smart, won't be in fossil fuels forever. They will be deliverers of energy. And how do you account for the transformation that needs to happen to be paint in such a broad brush? Say no fossil fuel bed, and then you lump together all of the companies that are in that industry, regardless of their position or what they're doing on renewables or on other, you know, accelerating the transformation. Of the Could you maybe come up so we can go through attendance? Ah uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Matt, why don't you stand? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, virtual. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jason, um, I must uh, acknowledge that you your eloquence and your yeah. sorry, <laughs> Jenna, that's, that's just, <laughs> <laughs> um, your eloquence and, and uh, persuasion tactics, I think, are 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 strong. Um, I think that. There are a, a, a few premises that you spoke about, though, that I would, I would challenge on. One is um, the duty to act. I think that inside um, the world of corporate governance, the duty to act is um, also within shareholder activism, right? And I think that there is generally a more reception, a receptive audience um, when you have a seat at the table, when you can. Um, Build an alliance from uh, and within the shareholder community. Um, I think that the other uh, the other premise that I want to challenge you on was um, it 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 may not um, it may not change the political dynamics at play um, if political if, if diminishing the political activism. <coughs> Of uh, fossil fuel companies is a goal. I think that it's a very different kind of goal to pursue than that which is domestic. So I think that um, you have strong ideas, and you there are certainly campuses around the country that see this as a unifying um, movement. And so anything that unifies, <laughs> right, in this time of country, I think, is good. The question is, um, that what? Right? And I'm not sure that, um, again, your, the, the underlying principles are necessarily um, tied to the outcome today. Uh, and I'll just have one point before I call in the audience, which is just to think about, there is no scenario, I don't think, that anybody is talking about where fossil fuels are not a major portion of our energy force over the next couple of decades or more. Uh, and the investment, when taken to its maybe its illogical extreme, says we're not going to have fossil fuels. And in fact, we are going to have fossil fuels. So they've got a seat at the table. They will have a seat at the table. They need to have a seat at the table in any of these conversations. Um, Andrea, please. Do I, do I come up? Yeah, come up <laughs> so that, because the camera is still on, you sure. can't see our. Uh, my name is Andrea Yitzamba. I'm with the Blue U.S. Climate Initiative. So I really appreciate the vision and the, uh, the clarity of your message. Um, and I wanted to introduce, I think, some additional nuance really building on the comments um, into this conversation. And uh, I'm sure you've thought about a lot of this. But I think the, the most um, sophisticated and effective activist efforts simultaneously in public fight and behind the scenes negotiate and have conversation. And I think the real power in what you're doing is the ability to open up a dialogue with the very groups that Bill McKibben has named public enemy number one. And I understand the rationale for doing that, and I understand the power of doing it, but I actually think we have to move beyond that. 
um, the fossil fuel industry has to become part of the conversation and part of the solution. Um, and they have to be providers at the table at the same time as people are working against their carbon sort of impacts. Um, so um, I've been in conversations with um, some senior policy people within the fossil fuel industry in the past few weeks. And what was so striking to me, and then in retrospect not surprising, was how much they said they wanted a national climate and energy policy that reflects a true consensus on these issues in the country. That will create a much better environment for them to do what they want to do on this issue. And they are feeling um, many of the same constraints that Republican members of Congress now are feeling, the ones who want to act on this personally, that feel they don't have the space. So they're very frightened, the people I've spoken with in the fossil fuel industry, frightened to get ahead of their customers and shareholders. So I think it's really important as you proceed in this to think about what are the ways in which this opens up dialogue and who, space where they can be part of building toward this true national <coughs> policy based on national consensus, not just the enemy. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. Other comments, please? <laughs> My name is Annie and I'm doing a massive finance here at MIT. Uh, my question would be, um, what do you define as fossil fuel investment? So, like, if I look at this, is it better to invest in an energy company uh, which does a lot of its, its business in fossil fuel versus a manufacturing company who is actually not better when it comes to energy efficiency? And my second question would be, um, do you have any recommendations for reinvestment? Because, like, I've read, like, cases about, like, like the Norwegian sovereign fund who divested at Walmart several years ago because they um, they were like abolishing human rights. So like, do you actually do recommendations towards like social impact investing as in like oh, least divest, um, but rather than reinvesting <coughs> other bad investments to like I don't know renewable energy. Thank you very much. Can we take one or two more, please? Sir. <laughs> Hi, my name is Eric Horvitz. I have a proposal in the carbon pricing category, so thanks for the shout out. In California, maybe you're familiar with this, but there is an organization called Fossil Free Indices that did a study of the largest pension fund in the country, CalPERS, and determined the degree to which that fund is directly invested in unburnable reserves. And of course, the same thing could be done for MIT. Yep. And to build on Andrea's comment, you know, I don't think it's so much that fossil free MIT needs to be negotiating with, with, with uh, you know, fossil fuel companies so much as MIT needs to be doing that. You know, so I, I, I encourage you to go in that direction. Yep. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Kim Slack. I'm uh, with uh, uh, Sustainable Belmont, which are a small um, citizen group. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work trying to get a carbon fee uh, introduced into the city. Hold the mic. Hold it up. We can't hear you. Sorry. Um, we've been doing a lot of work trying to get a carbon fee introduced to the state of Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, uh, Victoria in the previous uh, thing said if we can get large employers. MIT is a huge employer in the state, as are many other universities. Uh, the Harvard School of Public Health has come out saying that uh, climate change is a huge threat, uh, as, as has um, been used. I wonder if we, if, if, um, Working with uh, Senator Barrett, who's introduced this legislation, if you could reach out to other universities, uh, to student organizations as well as the faculty, uh, you could form a larger coalition that would move forward on uh, a state carbon fund. And um, you know, maybe the universities won't be able to make uh, public announcements uh, advocating this, but they certainly could. They, they all have. Uh, government liaison offices that uh, influence public policy. It's, it's considerable that they are continually making private statements to legislators 
in favor of certain policies. So I would encourage you to do that. Okay, I'm now going to give um, Jeffrey a couple minutes to respond. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so thank you to everyone for the. Would you mind switching it off again? It's okay. Um, in the back, can you yeah. just turn you on the okay. yeah. 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 Nice. So thanks to everyone for all the suggestions. I probably can't answer them in an entirely systematic way because it's kind of a barrage. But, um, I made some notes, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. I won't say which thing I'm referring to, but I'll just make some points. Um, I think early on, Jason asked about you know the sort of sliding scale of carbon intensities and things like that. So just to clarify, right now our Cool, uh, is to divest from the 200 um, fossil fuel extraction companies with the largest carbon reserves in the world. Um, and it goes on the logarithmic scale, uh, the carbon intensity. So the top 10 companies have something like 50% of global um, privately held reserves. And so uh, I, I guess there is certainly a recognition about the fact that a very small number of companies, the really big ones, hold most of the fossil fuel reserves. And so although you, know, you have to have an ask when you're negotiating for something, we're of course flexible in that negotiation, if, as long as we can have the negotiation and the discussion. Um, and it's worth recognizing that those big companies tend to also be the ones that are complicit in the disinformation campaigns in the lobby. So you sort of uh, conquer two birds with one stone. Um, and so the, the other thing to recognize, however, is that as far as I know, no fossil fuel company in the world is committed to uh, reducing its carbon extraction uh, in intensities pro rata with its allocation of the global emissions budget. So no company sort of sticks within the, its, um, its allowance. Um, another question was about um, going beyond this and thinking about sort of broader youth engagement and things like that. Um, it's worth noting that, so this campaign spans about 700 divestment institutions around the world, uh, including almost every university and college in the US. Um, and I have to be frank that it really has changed my life if I speak personally. Um, I, it's completely you know, transformed the, the, the trajectory of my my career. Um, since I became involved, I've been involved in climate activism and rallies. Um, I helped to organize and was at the People's Climate March. Um, I'm a UN delegate and I'll be in Peru with some of my friends um, for the UN Climate Conference in a month. Um, and through this uh, divestment campaign, uh, we've engaged with, in 18 months of negotiation with the MIT administration. And that's actually led to fruitful conversations. And as I mentioned, they've launched this campus-wide so-called climate change conversation whose specific purpose is to identify all the actions that MIT can take to mitigate global warming, including divestment. So we'll be looking at sustainability, other forms of political engagement, um, and, and so, so really the idea is that divestment can spawn a whole bunch of, of uh, initiatives, and we think that divestment is a powerful part of that. Um, I'm only about a quarter of the way through my notes. One more minute. So another point was that you know, perhaps this won't really shift political dynamics. Um, just one anecdotal comment, however, is the Australian National University, they chose to divest um, just a month or so ago. It immediately um, led to the Australian Prime Minister calling the act stupid, um, and the Prime Minister of the country, right, and a number of the top governmental officials. And so the suggestion that this doesn't have the ability to yield a megaphone to public and political opinion, I think is, is, is probably not quite true. Um, and, uh, <laughs> The other, the other big question, I think, was you know, these fossil fuel companies probably have to play an incremental role, uh, uh, sorry, an integral role in tackling the climate crisis. And we're not saying, we don't hate these people, or at least most of us don't. The idea is, <laughs> the, the suggestion is that perhaps oil companies can become energy companies and lead the way in research, for example, with carbon capture and security. They, they have the infrastructure and expertise to lead the way in this. But as I said, none of them are so far even committing to doing that. A lot of them. Uh, make a lot of talk. For example, you know, Shell, for example, says we want to price on carbon, uh, we want policy, and so on. But at the same time, Shell invests in the American Legislative Exchange Council that funds anti plastic information campaigns. So, as, as you mentioned in, in the plenary, in the panel before, you can't speak out of the two sides of your mouth. Um, I think I'll stop there. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get right. Screen uh, our third and final winner, uh, Shinbar Shinbar Garsh or Rajan Kandarajan. Uh, takes a second to warm up. What I okay, so about. he'll be coming on to speak about the pollution meter uh, project. So, do we have the audio? Or this week we're going to be seeing a video. Is that correct? First, so first we'll see a video that he's produced, uh, and then we'll have him on the screen. So. Uh, Okay, 
here we are. Do is they help design um, 
energy efficiency programs on a residential basis. And what they've been telling, uh, I have to speak with someone from there recently, they're always looking for new, uh, new platforms or pollution that are going to be another way to change the customer community better on how their personal decisions could change. So maybe there is a kind of incentive. As a consumer, you can maybe they can incentivize me based on um, not just the sheer energy usage of my home, say, but what my pollution is. Um, maybe through rental car um, programs, maybe it's something you can opt in for. Um, I think that there's a lot of, of existing platforms that ultimately have a customer relationship manager. Hi, I'm Jason. Uh, what's talking is so the low power linkage that we have that is really interesting to kind of focus on sort of the home uh, electricity and gas aspect of things. Um, the examples of the images that we show were from vehicles, um, and I think. The idea of creating a broader context. Um, I also like the idea of, of road sign uh, panels that would, you know, tell people about pollution levels that are in sort of clean, visual uh, look and feel and same metrics as what they're getting out of their near inside their car. So that people can make a direct connection between what they're seeing in the atmosphere around them and what their car themselves is doing. I think there's a real art form there in um, making it understandable to the customer, to the user. Um, I think you know if we get into you know you know parts per million in a you know, or something like that, it's going to be very hard for people to understand. I think that retail shelves idea from Hannah about you know red, yellow, green. I think it's great. Um, you know, something along the lines of a simple to communicate visual language that's um, is the key. And again, you know, the language that you're getting feedback from the car is the same as the language you're getting from the title of the car. Um, in India and in China, right, air pollution is such a strong issue to say, okay, today is a, you know, a red day, and my car is cranking through. You know, when I hit the gas and I have higher in the car, I think the question is, you know, what what's the actual implementation pathway that you get into cars and getting into cars is about working with car companies like Tata or Intra getting on the side of the roads is more of an urban thing. So it strikes me that this is something that requires a very multi-sectoral coalition building effort. Um, and that's probably best done in sort of a test city um, that has a very hot budget air pollution issue, um, but moderate enough size that you can actually get ahead. Maybe one of the more industrial towns um, in the outskirts of Beijing or in um, just outside of the mega cities where some of those are just a few trending thoughts that I have. Hi, it's Victoria. Um, you know, I love the idea of real time feedback on your emissions and um, using the terminology. I see the real time data collection on energy consumption And I'm wondering if you could support that connection and, and the whole sub metering in buildings and how how that technology is or your application. Yeah, Victoria's comment just made me think about the bill I just got from my electric company <laughs> yesterday. Show how my my consumption compared to my um, other um, thoughts, comments, questions? Oh, please come forward. 
this is a channel. Yes. Hello, I'm Rebecca. And uh, there is a whole universe of global change and climate related to climate change researchers who I don't know she may already be connected with. You already know how to mention behavior and the climate change network and conferences all the different I believe in December in Washington, D.C. It's been going on for about seven or eight years. Victoria and Pino. And um, so I did want to urge to uh, perhaps reference some of the literature. And, and some of the things that I've learned about, I'm not a professional in terms of are sometimes going towards um, what is the person's role and the politics. And I know I want to cut. So how am I doing? Okay, we're at 55% on this ride. Rather than, oh my god, I'm in the red zone. Pulling a little bit on, on the thread that Jason had, uh, in, in some markets, uh, FedEx, UPS, um, there's a complete management issue that's trying to ultimately provide data about their payments to, um, to, to their customers. So to the extent that this could be able to be more transparency, or put downstream or shipping the files to their ultimate um, environmental footprint, there also might be uptake from there, and, and it might be it, yeah, might be more to, uh, so let me uh, turn back to you, uh, and uh, comments, reactions, please continue for it. Yeah, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, to answer some of your questions, uh, the actual use of this uh, project is to for us to divert towards the clean energy. So we are already in the fossil fuel stage. So we can't switch as such to the clean energy in a single step. So, so I started my thing with the uh, transportation field where we can just measure the amount of pollution we are causing and tax based on that. I know the taxing is already existing like uh, the carbon trading, the eco tax or things are existing. So, uh, mine would be like measure uh, based on carbon footprint based on each person and each car manufacturer. Can you ask on question? Can you hear me? Let's try again. Slowly, clearly, and you can turn your speakers to speak. Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? As I was explaining, the carbon footprint cost by each person should be measured now so that we can impose tax on each and every people in order to not oblige or make you do it, but it's a kind of bridge where you can get people to go for a cleaner energy like manufacturers like Toyota and Honda are creating a clean energy vehicles like hybrid hydrogen vehicle an electric car vehicle. So my idea basically is to divert people to know how much they are polluting and go towards the clean energy. The key point at the end there about people are aware of, of their impact and how they're driving and driving the way they're driving is impacting the pollution 
What I'd like to do now is the overall theme, we have another seven or eight minutes. Um, the overall theme of this section is influencing large firms. And I wrote down just a list of kind of dichotomies that are influencing large firms. On one hand, working from the inside of an organization versus working from, from the outside, you know, being a shareholder or being out on the street or protesting, being outside of another dichotomy was small scale versus large impact. Another was public action uh, versus private negotiation and engagement. Uh, another was caring versus sharing in terms of rewards and how much you want to rewards and how much you want to get. I think the same is why we're here uh, impacting consumers as well. Uh, there's also the dimension of industry specific. Most of these were industry specific, uh, dealing with the, uh, the auto industry or retail foods or the extraction industries. The horizontal impact is another dimension. Uh, and the last one I would mention is you probably all know the expression of the market being good, and the question of how do we get the balance right between what we ideally want and what would be good enough for what would be a step in the right direction. So, with those, one possible way of framing some of this conversation is comments. Can we bring back up both of the commissions? Uh, so we'll, we'll see both Kenda and um, uh, Hannah on the screen and uh, invite any kind of comments, either direct to individuals, um, individual winners, or to the panel in terms of the comments that they made. And definitely start with the panel if you want to make any specific questions. There you go. It just strikes me that in the first two ideas, uh, a lot of the, uh, the relevancy factor is based on an enlightened consumer process. Uh, whether you're a consumer or you're an investor in the consumer process, or whether or not you're a consumer of sustenance. Um, and what is interesting is there are some trends and recent studies that show, for example, that um, younger employees or new recruits to brands actually um, are saying that they are no more loyal to those brands and institutions for their environmental and social record. Um, that, that trend has actually been um, rising and now maybe related to the um, fragile economy, people just have jobs, you know, or there's just so little trust in brands. I don't know what the drivers are, but that's far down. Um, and then also if you look at what younger technology you consume do, they consume more energy. Um, so I'm just, it just strikes me that on the one hand, there seems to be an appetite for an enlightened consumer consciousness and solutions to the past that market. And at the same time, uh, they're, they're divergent, um, both in trends of where younger um, younger graduates seem to be more important and also their own personal habits. I argue that car sharing and other trends throw that to the mix and then the bottom picture. I'm curious to know from the presenters today or from the audience what they make of these things. That's the point. Comments, reactions to that point, or other observations on uh, influencing large firms and the individual presentation today? Yes, please come forward. <laughs> I'm here because I work with citizens by the way. Our proposal is to move this from the first to ever. I want to address the investment for you. Right here, we have You took a lot of hits in the community. And I just want to point out that investment is part of an ecosystem of climate action. 
And I don't think they are seriously under the impression that by investing in the my team or the portfolio that they're going to solve the problem of climate change. Because it doesn't really hurt directly companies that are producing fossil fuels. But, and I'm in the big myself. But I think there's another element, and that is if we make some financial for a portfolio and portfolio if we ever do these things about tackling climate change, those reserves whose uh, eventual profits are figured into the market, that's why a price on carbon uh, that we're proposing is part of that solution. Because if we do make a lot of things in the ground, which we must do, uh, those companies instantly get to the And then investors and analysts, portfolio managers, will recommend an orderly transition of the investments from that sector of the economy to the economy. The other thing investors as actually students and youth are vital here. And once they get involved, they start learning about the problem, they realize that a lot more is necessary. Other comments with Kathy Buckley, uh, Climate Reality, and MIT alum has signed a fossil fuel uh, petition. I, I agree that the education is really important, but the education is really important. Those drivers don't know that a gallon of gas can be from the dioxide, so it's actually the actions out there, but it's also. You know, each one of us individually, and I, I agree that negotiations with fossil companies are important. I think this actually exists in all of that. And I think um, Michelle wants to put a full page ad on the New York Times demanding a carbon tax, or if they want to you know, really get in there and um, negotiating with, with the Jacoby Post and the Post Office, that would be terrific. Let's see what's the best we can do to improve that and help them. Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming to the session on influence in large firms. Thank you to our leaders now, and Ted uh, remotely, and to Jeffrey, who is here, thank you to our, our panelists. Uh, I'm now going to try to keep it and move to the next session, which is thank you about the cards. So, those of you that have cards, if you want to have something specific to say to Jeffrey, you can give it to him. Uh, if you want to to uh, Anna or uh, Shemba, you have a choice. You can give it to me, or you can go to the Action uh, website and fill it in go directly. Uh, so thank you for coming to this session. Uh, we're now going to go to lunch, which is in Walker Memorial. Uh, for those of you who are not going to go to lunch, uh, you're going to walk down uh, a just a few minutes. Follow the crowd, uh, and then we'll be briefly moving back. I think that's 145 in um, Africa.